Today we are here with Denise Garth, Chief Strategy Officer at Modesto. Welcome, Denise. Thanks. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, it's always exciting to talk strategy and marketing um, and kind of get a sense for finger on the pulse what's happening in other organizations. So thrilled to get the chance to chat today. Absolutely. All right. So let's jump in. With all this change and increased competition. How do you build brand loyalty in an environment like this? A really great question. Um, I think, you know, everybody's kind of experimenting in, in a few different things. Um, but I think at the end of the day, brand is going to be built upon um, um, uh, three different aspects. In the past, we've always thought about the product as the risk product, as an industry. And that risk product was always based upon the value that you could give to the customer to make sure that when they had a claim, they'd be able to pay the claim. Um, you know, were you an AM best um, A plus rated company? Uh, did you have the financials behind it? It's really moved beyond that. And today that product that you're selling is not just the risk product, but it's also the experience that they have, as well as uh, the value added services that you might get along with that, that product. And so where can we have claims that have straight through processing that are very simple, we could just get it done and it's really a, a value added services. And then you've got the complex claims that are just gonna take more time. But does it mean that you can't do things digitally? Can the customer provide a video of, of, the, of the damage? Can they provide photos? You know, how can you kind of engage with them a little bit different? And then the value added services, what can we do to make sure that we help them to mitigate their risk? How can we help them avoid um, having a claim? And so those are where some of the value added services come in is that we're providing more value because they don't wanna have their asset damaged. They wanna be able to continue to use that asset and make sure that it's, you know, uh, retains its value. And that's the type of thing that customers are really looking for. They want their lives to be made easier. They want to look at things a little bit more holistically. And it offers insurers an opportunity to engage on a more frequent basis than they do today whenever you're paying for your uh, policy or you're submitting a claim. Not exactly the two best opportunities right. to kind of engage with a customer. The others right. offer much greater opportunity to have a really uh, positive kind of um, uh, relationship that really build that brand loyalty. I love that. Really expanding the value chain to have positive interactions. I think so many of the challenges we, we face in insurance when it comes to insureds is that communicating the value of what we do. You know, it's something that, I, I, as you mentioned, you touch when you pay for it or something bad happens. Not fun times, either of those touches. So I think taking peace of mind to the next level, being proactive, uh, certainly adds a ton of value. And certainly to enable all of those pieces, as you mentioned, we're talking about partnerships. So how, how have partnerships, how have they evolved over the last five, 10 years in the industry? So, you know, they've, they've continued to evolve in that, you know, we've got a lot of partnerships in uh, companies that are setting up affinity-based uh, programs. You know, you've got uh, the Hartford as an example that does it with AARP, you know, for different types of products. You know, you've got other organizations doing it with other large businesses or associations. And so, You've had the affinity and the program um, business, you know, where you're trying to kind of provide products into certain um, unique segments, I guess, and unique relationships. But we're seeing um, the need to really expand that view about partnerships much beyond that, uh, from just partnering with them that you're selling a product through them, or it might be white labeling, to saying, how could we actually embed the insurance into the purchase of another product? Yeah, it, it really is. Um, a fundamental shift in the industry, right? Changing the value proposition, shifting it, uh, and adding so much more value and changing the image of insurance itself, which is really exciting. And a key theme across all of these is sort of that digital approach, you know, those touch points exactly when they're needed. And digital first is certainly a term you hear a lot when we're talking about these transformations. So how would you define digital first? how I define digital first is that you've got to build it up. Uh, uh, you build out the product and the experience based upon the customer. It's an outside in perspective. As an industry, we've typically built it from an inside out perspective based on all of our business assumptions that we've had for 50, 100 years. This is what 
this is how we price a product. This is what a product is. This is, you know, yeah. this is the approach that we take it for this type of product. And I think that the insure techs, uh, the MGA startups and the full stack insure startups have challenged some of that model. And as a result, they've kind of been innovative in some of the products that they've been de defining. In some ways, they've been um, uncoupling a lot of products because we kind of pulled all different kinds of writers and all kinds of um, aspects of a product together. And they're in many ways uncoupling it to kind of make it on demand, embed it within another purchase, all those different types of things that are more relevant to an individual. And that's where, you know, a digital first kind of concept comes into play, which by the way, is the reason we kind of called our digital platform digital first, um, is because it's got to be able to create that kind of digital experience. And that, you know, for, for um, partners like um, Bold Penguin, as an example, that many insurers have, being able to t tie that into an ecosystem that you can kind of tie Bull Penguin into that, that they can all um, have access to the products that are available to be able to kind of do an initial quote and kind of introduce that. We've got to be able to think how you kind of bring this all in. So it's not just about capabilities and data, it's about other partners who can provide that distribution reach as well. Right, and those seamless connections, those seamless integrations. Yes that improve your workflows don't create an additional hindrance to your workflow certainly it just seems like it's 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 just magic it's kind of what you know the big tech guys do they make it look like it's magic right and it just is it just happens without you realizing everything that goes on behind the scenes right and oftentimes we think about you know these transformations being having a start and a finish right all right, we're, we're going to go through a digital transformation and we'll be done. Um, but obviously it's more of an ongoing process. So, so what advice do you have for organizations that are still in the trenches of these digital transformations? To think that your systems are gonna last for 10, 15, 20 years like they did in the past, isn't gonna be the case. You're gonna have to be able to have partners that are providing solutions technology solutions or ecosystem partners that you're connecting in with that are gonna be forward thinking, that are gonna keep out there on the edge at, at leveraging the different technologies that are emerging and how they're being adopted and how they're being used and are going to be able to upgrade. Think about Apple, how easy is it to upgrade your phone? Right. You know, how easy is it to upgrade all that stuff? We've gotta to get to that kind of a world that it, it, that's how easy it is to upgrade. When we can actually do that for our technologies, then all of a sudden we can begin to bring in all the other things that we want because that just becomes a way of, of dealing with it. But thinking that you're gonna do implement it once and then you don't have to think about it for another 15, 20 years, I'm sorry, that's just not gonna happen because we're gonna go through some additional dramatic change because we're just on the verge of millennials and Gen Zs becoming the dominant buyers in our marketplace. They have a whole different set of behaviors and needs. Their lifestyles are different. They may not own vehicles. They may be renting for a period of time. How are we gonna create products for them? We have a lot of change ahead and it's a, great, it's a great opportunity for growth. And it's such an exciting time that I think that we just need to find and embrace it, but you've gotta be a leader. Absolutely, the only constant is change. So if you're, Absolutely. Not, if you're not leading, you probably won't be quickly following. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's and it's going to cost leader. you more money to try to catch up on top of it. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Really enjoyed your insights. And yeah, here's to our combined digital future. Absolutely. Thank you so much and look forward to speaking again soon. Thanks.